Good morning. It's so good to be here with you today. I want to uh, just start with a quick poll. You're, you're welcome to not participate if you don't want to. But uh, we've got people here who kind of lean in the camp of the rule follower camp. And we have some people who are in the rule breaker camp. How many of you, show of hands, are the classic rule followers among us? Okay. And how many of you lean towards the side of rule breaking? Oh, good. Well, we just wanted to identify who the worst sinners were. Um, so thank you. It has nothing to do with the message at all. Um, I, we just wanted to, to see. <laughs> okay, so uh, rules, rules in our lives, some of them can be really helpful. And some of them can honestly uh, be frustrating for us sometimes, especially when we feel like, I don't understand why this is here. And uh, so with our kids, we have tried to say, we have five rules or what we call them our five family values. Um, so I have a picture here. This is actually taken from a couple of years ago. Uh, right, so cute, so cute, <laughs> the good old days. But uh, we, we have five family values that, that we operate by. The Sigmunds are kind, the Sigmunds obey, We've had to clarify right away. <laughs> Timing is important. <laughs> Sigmunds are thankful. Sigmunds tell the truth. And the value I live out best, Sigmunds are fun. We have fun. And so uh, for us, when we come to the Bible, when we come to God's word, um, especially in the Old Testament, which is uh, the, the original uh, Hebrew, what is written well before Jesus's time, it can feel like, man, there is just this humongous rule book that like, I don't even know what to do with. And um, oftentimes the, the criticism that will be given of, of God, of the, of the Christian God, is that it's like, man, it seems like God is just so controlling. Like he just wants to like control every one of our actions. It seems like God is so overbearing. And then for followers of Jesus, it's kind of like, what do we do with all of these Old Testament laws? Because didn't Jesus say he's all about like freedom and grace? And so like, do we just kind of throw that away? And it's like, what, what do we do with all these Old Testament laws? And honestly, there's some, there's some strange ones when you read through. If you read through a book like the book of Leviticus, you read it and you're like, I, I do not understand why God would say this or have this be one of the commands to his people. And this was the same question that the early church was wrestling with right after Jesus had come. And we're gonna get into that discussion, but before we do, I wanna talk about the law. And when I'm talking about the law, I'm talking about the Old Testament law. This is like 13th century BC. This is, this is way before the time even of Jesus. So let's start with an origin story. Everybody loves a good origin story. Batman begins, you know, those are, those are the best, right? We wanna know why things are the way they are. So uh, the origin of the law, the law is really part of the story of God. And um, so, you know, so, so the setting of this, it's this super, super hot wilderness. You've got a people who have been living in slavery for hundreds of years. They've been under the finger of oppression for a really long time. And, and anytime you're in a, a situation like that, they don't have things like infrastructure or leadership or education systems. Like they, they, don't, they don't have any of that. And so the conflict arises all throughout as they are in this oppression, but then God frees his people. But guess what? they still have all these problems because of this life they had been under for hundreds and hundreds of years. So they're exhausted. They've been suffering immensely. They haven't even had a good model of what good godly living would even look like. And they themselves are a sinful, broken, whining, complaining people themselves. And so the solution 
that God gives in the midst of all of this story in conflict is God in his love and in his wisdom gives Moses the law. He gives Moses the law. So what is the purpose of this law that we have? Well, there's three purposes that I want to discuss today. And the, the first that I want to discuss is to, to think about the law as like a metaphorical fence. And, you know, if you see a, a, like a fence around a playground, if, if you see a playground and you see a fence around it, you might initially think, or, or somebody may say, like, what in the world? Why would there be a fence around the playground? Like, shouldn't we be encouraging kids to finally get off their screens and finally be able to run and play like the good old days used to be? Like, why would you, why would you put this fence? It, it looks like we're trying to keep children out of this place and out of this space. And I will tell you, this is the same logic often that gets used around the boundaries that God gives even today. But part of the purpose of that fence in this metaphorical sense is that if this playground is right near a dangerous road and you've got toddlers who may run out into it, you as a parent are really grateful for this fence. Because I always think about it, it's like, if you're, if you're a parent of a toddler, like you're, you, you're just in this, like you, you do that all day long. So you're like, finally, I have a fence that I don't have to stand in a half squat position uh, for these at least hour while we're here. But really the law here is a, is a gift. It really is a gift. And the law was a gift to help the people God loves to live healthy lives in community. And it's important to recognize that this was the heart intention of the law. So it, it starts most basically with the Ten Commandments. You're probably familiar with those. Part of them apply to loving God. Part of them apply to loving other people. But there are many, many more laws that exist within the Old Testament, within the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And uh, in, in there, there is 613 different commands that are given to the people. And again, at first glance, you might think, man, especially if you're just reading them straight, you're like, wow, this is a lot of rules and a lot of laws for these people to try to live up to. And I don't even understand half of these things, reading them hundreds, thousands of years later. But I was thinking about this. We live in America, love America, my favorite <laughs> country on the planet. We're the land of the free. And I, I Googled this actually. How many laws have been passed nationally in the land of the, three, of the free? It's like 30,000 laws. And that's not state and local ordinances either, by the way, which is another whole pile on top of that. And so I say this not to like be like, let's compare 613 to 30,000. That's, that's not the biggest point. The biggest point here is that the law was a gift that was meant for human flourishing. That was the intention of it. The second purpose of the law was to show people the truth about ourselves that even when we knew better, we would not always do better. You see, the law, it, it's like a light that illuminates our own inability to live up to its expectations. And here's, here's the thing that I think is that every honest and reflective person really knows that we can't live up to the standard of the law. Like, we can't even live up to our own standards or other people's standards, let alone what it seems like is God's standards. I mean, maybe for you, you sinned already on the way to church. <laughs> you cut somebody off. You swore at somebody. You thought something you shouldn't have thought. You sped on your way here. I mean, that's not a sin. You're going to God's house. So, you know, you got to get there on time and worship him, you know. So, uh, but no, right? Like, we know we can't live up to the law. And here's the thing is I, I love what the way that Paul writes this in the letter to the Romans. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. 
Now, if I do not want, I agree with the law, that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Paul says, I don't do what I want to do. I do what I don't want to do. And can I just say, like, one of the things I love absolutely most about scripture is when it can articulate things that I think and that I feel so much better than I can and give me insights into myself about why I am how I am. And I feel like Paul really does this so, so well here. And the thing is, is that that a healthy Christian knows the laws of God, but also knows that we cannot live up to them perfectly. The law was a gift because it gave us clarity for us to see where we actually need God. And that relates right to this third purpose of the law. And that is that the third purpose of the law was to make a way back to God. You know, can I just tell you that this, is, this has always been the heart of God, that he has always wanted to make a pathway for you and for me as broken people to come back home to him. This has always been who he is, to run back as the prodigal, as the messed up son, to run back into his loving arms. That has always been who God is. And so even when God gave the law to Moses, he knew, even as he gave it to them, they ain't gonna live up to this. So instead of allowing their own wrongdoings to crush them, or to separate them from a perfect, pure God, God makes a pathway back to him. Maybe you're familiar with this, or maybe you're not. But in the Old Testament, what they would do to be able to come before a perfect, pure, holy God. And we underestimate just how powerful his holiness is. But if you stood in God's presence and you had sin in your life, you could fall down dead. Like it's it's that powerful. Just a little bit of exposure could do that. But God wanted relationship with his people. So he does this thing where he says, if you bring me a pure goat or calf or, you know, ox, if you bring me a, a pure animal and you sacrifice it, that can be the atonement for your mistakes. And then you can come before a perfect, pure God. And for us today, this, this sounds culturally strange and bizarre, but the heart of what God was doing with the law and with the animal sacrifice was to make a way back home to him. Okay, so we've got the origin of the law. We understand the purposes of the law. And um, so this is, again, this is the question that the early church in Galatia is wrestling through. Now we fast forward in time. Jesus has died. He has risen again. And now we're in the early church. And they're trying to wrestle through like, okay, what, what do we do with this Old Testament law that we are under? Here's what Paul writes in Galatians chapter three. Why then was the law given at all? Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Christ Jesus, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by our faith. Now that this faith has come through Jesus, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So what does the law have to do with Jesus? Well, he answered this question 
very directly and very precisely for us in Matthew chapter five, when he says, do not think that I, Jesus, have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is the law filled full. Jesus is like the law in 3D, like three-dimensional. Like he came as 100% God and 100% man, and he modeled for us what it looked like to live out the law to perfection. He was loving and he was forgiving and he was kind and he was generous. And he gives us this actual walking, talking model of what it looks like to live out the laws of God here on earth. And Paul, what he says in his letter to Galatians is he's saying that, you know, if, if the law could have worked, we would have achieved connection with God through it. But our own sin and our own wrongdoings was just too much. It had too much control over us for that to ever be possible. But just like God did for Moses in the middle of a desert, and he has done the same thing for you and for me. He has made a way for us to come back home. And he did it through a different sacrifice. When Jesus willingly chose to go to the cross for you and for me, he died the death that you and I deserved so that we may be free. The way that Paul says it is he says in the passage we read, now that this faith has come, this faith has come through Jesus and through his resurrection. And when we trust in Jesus, verse 26, we become children of God through our faith that we place in him. You know, the start of a relationship with God is quite simple. It says, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And that starts you on this incredible pathway and journey towards freedom. And this is the good news of the gospel, that the law, that for you and me, honestly, is at first very crushing that we realize like, I, I can't live up to, I can't, I, I, I do what I don't wanna do, I do what I don't, like I'm so messed up, I've got so many failures. You're saying to me, pastor, if you knew all the skeletons in my closet, I don't know, I don't know that God really loves me. And here is the truth about the law, is that you can't live up to the law, but Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of the law for you and for me. That is really, really good news. This is the way that the Bible describes it. It says that Jesus's perfection, Jesus's, the church word, is righteousness. We sang about it this morning. Jesus's righteousness is placed onto us. Righteousness is a fancy way of saying right living by God. So when God looks at us, when we accept and put our faith and trust in him, God sees us. It's like we put on a white, pure, clean robe. Everything is clean. Everything is made new, perfectly clean when we trust in God. And now you and I are free from the weight of the law. If you are grateful for what Jesus has done, would you just say amen this morning? Amen. So, The question becomes then, can we just get rid of the law? Should we just kind of like cut those chapters out of the Bible? That doesn't seem right. But what what do we do? There's 613 commandments. What do we do with all of this? And I will tell you that um, there are honestly some differences of opinion uh, with Christians and even with scholars about what to do with this. But uh, one of the ways that um, people have talked about this is that the law can be in three different categories. That there is moral law, there is civil law, and there is ceremonial law. So uh, a moral law would be something like, do not murder. A a civil law would be something like Uh, self-defense. Here's somebody's coming onto your property, here's how you defend yourself or something like that. Maybe that's a civil law. And then there's the ceremonial laws. Those would be things about um, like animal sacrifices, how to set up the temple, things of this nature that God gave wisdom on. And so 
Part of the way that Christians will process this is to say, hey, Jesus has come and he has filled full the law. And so what that means, if we were to apply the Old Testament today, is that things like the ceremonial laws, like the animal sacrifice, we obviously don't do anymore because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for us. We don't have to do that anymore. So things like the ceremonial law, those are filled full. We don't need to do that anymore. But moral laws, we still don't uh, support murder as Christians. I hope you're on that side of that issue. Okay. And so uh, this, this is one way that Christians have processed this. And I think that um, in some ways that can be a helpful framework as you're looking at it. But there's a cautionary side if we are to just start putting the laws into categories. And first is that this is not how the Jewish people in the early church thought about it or talked about it or wrote about it. This is not how Jesus thought, talked about it when he talked about it, uh, at least uh, specifically. And uh, lastly, I think that sometimes what that can do is we can miss out on the heart intention of the law for that time. The law gives us this, this it's, it's great wisdom literature. It helps us really understand what is at the heart of God. So Christians can fall on both sides of that. It's definitely not wrong to categorize the law. But the most important thing is to recognize the law is still important and still helpful for us. But ultimately, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and we find our freedom in him. The Apostle John said it like this, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, so maybe you feel like you're totally getting this. Maybe you're like, Zoop, way over my head. <laughs> That's okay. This, this, this can be a more complicated conversation. Um, but here's the good news is, um, I don't know if, if any of you guys back in the day, or maybe this still exists, there was a, a website called Sparknotes. Sparknotes uh, is, a, is a website where basically uh, it would take uh, like a great book and it would like synthesize it down and give you like chapter summaries and make sure you knew all the key points. I was a Sparknotes champ all through high school. I mean, I read all of the classics on sparknotes.com, Mockingbird, Gatsby, you name it. Um, you know, it's, it's a great way to be able to get a B <laughs> in school. Um, thankfully, all of our students are out of here. <laughs> and now you know which, whether I'm a rule follower or a rule breaker. <laughs> Lord's working on me. Okay, but here is the Sparknotes version of the law and all of it. Jesus makes it super clear to you and to me. You probably heard this before, but let it sink in. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. None is greater than these. The way that you and I live out the law is by loving God and loving other people. This is exactly how we live it out on our day-to-day -day life. The law all hinges upon this one, or maybe you say two things. Love God, love people. It's so foundational, but it's so essential as the framework for how you and I can help bring the kingdom of God forward here on earth to let his good news be known and to know that when you follow after Jesus, you, you die to your old self and you become a new creation in him. There is freedom in him because Jesus is the one who has fulfilled the law for you and for me so we can have direct access to God at any single moment. If you believe it, would you say amen this morning? Amen. So the question I want you to think about and wrestle through this morning, do you lean more towards the law side or more towards the freedom side? What is your bent? And here's the thing. I will tell you this. I don't even know that it's like necessarily like right or wrong. Like there's, there's, a, there's a better side or worse. Some of it, I think, is our personality. I don't know if it's nature, nurture. I, I don't have the, uh, the psychology report on that. 
But I believe that God is saying that there is importance in the law, and yet there is real freedom that is found in him. So if you're in the rules camp, if you're, if you're my rules people, you raised your hand earlier today. I, I, I do want to just first say this, is that a lot of times in our culture, people who follow not just the rules, but try to follow after what God has for us and tries to live a God-honoring life, it, it doesn't get a lot of credit. It gets a lot more criticism than anything else. And for you rules folks, you like things safe, you like things ordered, and these, these rules that can be in place can help us navigate some really complicated situations that we can run into. So it's, it's not bad, but my challenge for you to think about this morning is do you still experience grace on a regular daily basis in your life? Do you accept it regularly for yourself? Do you give out that grace to other people who also aren't living up to the law? How do you view them? Or maybe it's this, maybe it's that the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to take risks for him, to follow after just his voice and what he has. He's never gonna go against his word. You don't have to go against the law, but to follow after him and take a real risk in the Holy Spirit. And my freedom people, uh, let me know who you are later because you're, you're probably the good hang. <laughs> um, but, and again, there's some real strengths to this. You understand as a freedom person what it's like to walk in grace, to experience being a new creation in him, to, to, to understand just how good he is. You love fresh starts. But can I challenge you with this this morning? And I'd even encourage you to ask yourselves this question, these questions. Am I studying the guidelines of scriptures? Am I actually applying those boundaries to my life on a regular basis? Am I pushing the boundaries of grace, trying to find little loopholes that make this or this or this okay? And, and can, I, can I just say this, that every single person, no matter who you are, has rules for your life. Everybody does. But if you're in the freedom camp, who is the one that is ultimately setting the rules for your life? Is it you or is it God? I'm gonna invite you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And I wanna give you a moment to be able to talk to him today. Because remember, what God wants and who he has always been is he has always wanted a relationship with you. And he has invited you and I to a mission, to love God, to love people, to invite them in, to become disciples of him, to follow after his good and amazing plans that he has for their lives. This is the way that you and I live out the law best in our world. But for you this morning, if you are a law-leaning person, would you talk to God about operating in his freedom or taking risks that he might have for you? And for my freedom people, would you talk to God about following after operating within the loving boundaries that he has for you. I'm gonna give you a moment to talk to him. He is here. So God, this morning, would you help us to trust the boundaries that you have set for our own flourishing? 
And God, would you help us to live fully in the freedom that you came to give for you, for each one of us? And God, would you help us in our world to live and to love like you? If you want it to be true of your own self, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand and would you respond to his goodness as we sing out where our faith is founded? It is in Christ alone.